Hello everyone! The year is 1956 and here we have 13 year old Bobby Fischer, uh, at the moment he's uh, the reigning uh, junior champion of the United States and uh, th this is practically his first real test of skill. He was invited to play uh, in the third uh, Rosenwald uh, Trophy tournament which is basically the United States Championship, uh, only was called the Rosenwald Tro Trophy tournament uh, due to the fact that uh, Julius Rosenwald uh, made contributions that made this tournament possible. Uh, but after 1956 it became known as the United States Championship. So uh, here I decided to show you one game, uh, Arthur Bisgaier, a strong American Grandmaster versus the 13 year old Bobby Fischer. Uh, Bisgaier has the white pieces and uh, this is a really important game and a really important tournament uh, in the life of young Bobby Fischer, uh, but uh, I will say something more about that after we, we, we see the game. And uh, I prepared some uh, very nice statistics uh, uh, about uh, Bobby's progress over the next two years, uh, but also for the end of this video. So. Let's, let's see this game. Bisgar opens with d4. Uh, we have knight to f6, uh, c4, g6, knight to c3, and bishop to g7. So uh, Fisher goes for the king's Indian defense. We have e4, d6, f4 now, the four pawns attack, uh, bobby castles, knight to f3, and c5. Uh, we have bishop to e2, uh, c captures on d4, knight captures on d4, and knight to c6. Uh, and here uh, you could go for a developing move like bishop to e3, but if you go bishop to e3, then you allow black to uh, re relieve, relieve the tension somewhat after knight to g4, uh, offering a knight here, but also attacking this knight on d4 twice. So after bishop captures, bishop captures, bishop captures, and bishop captures, queen captures and knight captures, uh, black really simplified the position and it's going to be very hard for white to gain any advantage in this position. So after Bobby played knight to c6, uh, Bisgar instead of developing, he plays knight to c2. He avoids exchange the ex ex all of these exchanges in the center. Uh, bishop to d7, uh, castles, and now rook to c8. Uh, now bishop to e3, uh, we have knight to a5 and b3. Fischer goes for a6 and we have e5 now. Uh, d captures on e5, f captures on e5, and knight to e8. So okay, uh, if you look at this position now, Fischer has a somewhat an awkward knight on a5 and this uh, knight on e8 doesn't really uh, serve a lot of purpose at the moment but it, it's not unusual uh, when when white pushes e5 against the king's indian defense uh, to play uh, knight to e8 so uh, white is better but you know nothing de definite uh, knight to d5 by bisgar uh, here we have rook to c6 not allowing Bisgar uh, to play bishop to b6 to attack the queen, uh, the knight and the queen. And uh, here Bisgar plays knight to d4, attacking the rook. Uh, rook back to c8, and uh, Bisgar goes knight back to c2, again threatening bishop to b6. And here Bobby plays rook to c6 again. So if Bisgar would continue knight to d4, we would, after rook to c8, we would have a, a threefold repetition of moves, and uh, the game would end in a draw. Of course, uh, Bisgar considers himself a stronger player, and he does have the white pieces, so he doesn't go for knight to d4, he goes knight to b4. Again, attacking the rook, and uh, if the rook moves back, then bishop to b6 will definitely be an option. Uh, so, Bobby goes rook to e6, and uh, this was... Uh... Uh, this was maybe somewhat uh, greedy uh, of young Bobby, but uh, he decided uh, it, it was okay to grab the pawn on e5. So we have bishop to g4, rook captures on e5, and now bishop to b6, attacking Bobby's knight and queen. And although this seems like uh, white is winning a piece here, it's not really the case. Uh, Bobby plays queen to c8. Now you can't grab the knight because of bishop captures on g4. So first uh, bishop captures on d7, queen captures on d7, and only now bishop captures on a5. So Bisgar is up a piece now, but Bobby plays e6. And now if you if you move this knight, of course rook captures bishop, uh, you, you get your piece back. Uh, so we have knight to d3. And uh, you have a lot of options here uh, for black. Uh, do you do you capture this knight? Do you first move the rook, for example, to h5 and open up a discovered attack to white's rook? Uh, a lot of options here, and Bobby goes for rook to h5. Now this knight on d5 is still attacked. The bishop is now attacking the rook, so you do have to you do have to uh, play a, play a good move here as white. Uh, bishop to b4 attacking black's rook on f8 is definitely an option, uh, but Bisgar goes for an even stronger move. He plays knight three to f4. Uh, now attacking Fischer's rook on h5, 
And uh, here, it's a really complicated position. If you decide to play something like bishop captures on a1, uh, then white can simply play knight captures on h5. And after you capture on b5, queen captures on a1, uh, g captures on h5, and uh, now you see that uh, there's a problem here. Uh, you can't really grab this knight, this is the problem. Uh, if you grab it, then you get bishop to b4, attacking black's rook, uh, and you, you have to give up the rook. If you try and defend it with knight to d6, then you get uh, queen to e5. There's a double attack on the knight now. Still can't move it, uh, you're going to lose the rook. So after you play rook to d8 to defend the knight, uh, now comes the simple queen g5 check, king f8, queen f6, uh, uh, with uh, with the threat of bishop captures on d6 after queen captures queen captures on f7 would be checkmate uh, so queen to c6 queen to c7 so now if bishop captures uh, rook can capture on d6 but now rook to e1 uh, threatening checkmate with the queen on h8 and after black stops this now uh, bishop to c3 and there is no defense against queen to h8 checkmate so after this, uh, capturing the uh, capturing the rook on a1 would end bad for black, uh, whatever, whatever black decided to play after that. Uh, so Fisher played rook to f5. Uh, now we have bishop to b4, attacking Fisher's rook on f8. Uh, we have e captures on d5, now bishop captures on f8. And uh, here, uh, Fisher Fisher really wanted to hold on to everything. If he if he wanted to continue playing this game, he would have to play king captures uh, on f8. And then, with being the exchange down, try and continue this game. Uh, but he wanted to, to keep everything, and he played bishop captures on a1. We have queen captures on a1, and now king captures on f8. So, after all of this uh, is said and done, uh, Fisher is actually up a pawn after all of this. Uh, but there is one problem. There is queen to h8, uh, which Bisgar, of course, plays. Queen to h8, check. Uh, king to e7, only move, now comes rook to e1 check, king to d8, and now comes knight captures on d5. So the material is completely even, uh, 5 pawns each. Uh, the pawn structure is pretty much uh, pretty much uh, the same on both sides. Both players have two pawn islands, uh, a knight and a rook and a queen. And uh, here you have to play, you, you have to play something. Uh, so first we have queen to c6 uh, by Fisher. Uh, queen to f8 by Bisgar, and uh, this is uh, this comes with a simple threat of queen to e7 check. The king will have to move, and then que queen picks up the knight on e8. So Fisher defends this. We have queen to d7, and now we have rook to d1. Rook to d1. Uh, there could be a very nasty, <laughs> nasty discovery here. Uh, for example, if the rook comes, knight comes to c3 or to e3. So uh, Fisher defends this with rook to f6. With the idea, of course, if you capture the rook, you're going to lose the queen. And uh, now that uh, the rook is on f6, um, Fischer thought that he actually stopped uh, Bisgar's main idea. And uh, it's actually a pretty cool position for you to solve. So you're playing with the white pieces here. Uh, this is your opportunity to, to punish uh, young Bobby for playing rook to f6. And uh, you have... Uh, there's really only one move that does this, like, instantly. So I will give it a couple of seconds as usual, uh, do pause the video. So for those of you who found the move, you're an excellent player, congratulations. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, knight to c3 and knight to e3. If you found any of these moves, uh, you're not uh, going to beat Bobby Fischer most likely. Uh, because knight to e3 or knight to c3, uh, black simply plays rook to d6. This was the idea of Bobby's rook to f6. And uh, now you don't really... You don't really have a way. If you exchange everything on d6, the material is equal, you're not going to win this endgame, and you have to block again with knight d5, and after black pushes f5, all, you know, white's going to have a very hard time winning this game. Uh, but on the other hand, after Bobby played rook to f6, if you found queen captures on e8, uh, then you would indeed uh, beat Bobby Fischer, and you are an excellent player. Uh, what's the idea? Well, of course, if king captures, then simply knight captures on f6, uh, forking the king and queen. King e7, you simply pick up uh, the queen and you're up a rook and the knight, a completely winning game. Uh, on the other hand, after queen to e8, if you play queen captures, again you get rook captures on f6, uh, which is slightly better for black, but, uh, you know, after you lose the queen, you do pick up the knight, but still, white is up a whole rook, uh, there's no point in playing this. So, after queen captures on e8, uh, Bobby Fischer resigned the game, and uh, 
a, a nice victory for American Grandmaster Arthur Bisgaier uh, from the 1956 uh, third Rosenwald Trophy Tournament. And uh, the reason I said that uh, this game and tournament was uh, very important in the life of young Bobby Fischer is uh, that this is uh, the first and last game Bobby Fischer ever lost to Arthur Bisgaier. So this game uh, Bisgaier won, the next game they played uh, was a draw and then over the course, uh, I believe over the next 14 years, uh, Bobby Fischer won all the games they ever played. I believe uh, he scored 13 consecutive wins against Arthur Bisgaier. Uh, probably due to <laughs> due to the fact that uh, Bisgar beat him like this in this tournament. And uh, another reason why I really thought it would be nice to show this game, uh, first I will show you the final standings of this tournament. So these are the final standings of the third Rosenwald Trophy tournament. Uh, Samuel Reshevsky really crushed the tournament with 9 out of 11, and here you have Arthur Bisgar uh, in second place with 7 out of 11. And Robbie Fisher, uh, Robbie, Bobby Fisher, uh, in ninth place uh, with four and a half out of 11 points with only two wins, uh, four losses and five draws. Uh, but uh, this is a very important tournament for Bobby Fischer because after this tournament pretty much everyone in the world heard about him as uh, this is the tournament where he created his, uh, his so-called uh, immortal game of the century uh, against, uh, against Donald Byrne. And uh, uh, if you haven't seen that game, uh, I made a video about it a couple of... Uh, months ago, I believe, maybe even six months ago. So I'll put a link in the description below for you to check it out. It's uh, re really an outstanding game. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to, to show you. So this is, uh, 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 this is these are the final standings from the 1956 tournament. And uh, now just to see how fast Bobby progressed, uh, I will show you uh, the final standings uh, of a tournament played a couple of months later. Uh, this is a tournament played in 19, uh, 1957, this is the 58th US Open tournament and here you have Arthur Bisgar in first place and uh, Robert James Fisher uh, in fourth place with 9 uh, out of 11 points. And uh, lastly we have uh, also the final standings of a tournament played also in 1957. Uh, this is now no longer called the, the Rosenball Trophy, uh, this is now the US Championship of 1957 through 58 as those tournaments were played in, you know, started in December and ended uh, next year. Uh, we have Robert James Fisher uh, first place a whole point ahead of Samuel Roshevsky uh, with 8 wins, 0 losses and 5 draws. So. Uh, you can see that uh, after th these are the standings in 1956, you have Fisher in ninth place. Here you have U.S. Open tournament Fisher in fourth place, and then already you know uh, the time difference between this third Rosenwald Trophy tournament and uh, the United uh, Ch States Championship Fisher won is one year. So <clears throat> already you can see how much stronger Fisher became in one year. And of course, you all know after that he will continue to win the United States Championship uh, for as long as he pleases. Uh, his famous uh, <laughs> famous win was the one where he won it with uh, without a single loss or a single draw, so that that was uh, you know very nice. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, you know, either of the these tournaments or either United States Championship that uh, Fisher won was is definitely a nice tournament for uh, a series maybe. So d definitely something to consider in the future. But I thought it was also important to show you. Uh, this game, how he started and how he didn't like immediately crush everyone he faced, uh, but you know it was it was uh, it wasn't slowly. It was like during the course of a year. But uh, he played a lot of games and a lot of tournaments, and uh, he really studied and really improved like drastically. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank. Uh, Felipe Pite, uh, Jared Curry, Dan Gove, uh, Nils Johan Torp, Robin Weir, and William Meyer for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Uh, hopefully, I, I will start my uh, Tal vs. Botvinnik series, but uh, I'm still preparing it. So, uh, see you soon.